All right, welcome to this live coding session on feature engineering. We're gonna be doing a ton of things. We're gonna grab these data sets that we have containing all of the row hands that our model can be learning from. And we're gonna convert this data into something that's understandable by a machine learning engineering model. And so all of this is gonna be the pipeline that we're gonna set up for our system. And it's gonna be pretty cool. So. As always, let's get started. Let's first of all make sure that we have a environment that's available for us to work in. So if you already went through the first live coding and you have gone through the pre-course setup, then you should have some kind of environment available. I call it MLOps, but obviously just, you know, go into whatever environment you've created for this course. I'm gonna do something like activate MLOps. All right, we are in the environment and we're gonna launch the Jupyter Notebook from this session. Obviously this only works if you are in the correct directory or correct folder. So for instance, for me, I put all of the material for this live coding session in MLOps in this, in this folder that I have in my repository. So now I can just do something like Jupyter Notebook and launch the material. I'm going to go into class session number two and I'm going to open the, oh, this one, the copy that I has, have set up. Uh, for you, you can just use the one that is class two feature engineering without a word copy. And so as a reminder, what we want to do in this course is we want to train a machine learning model to look at the cards that we have in our hands at the game of Ballot Manier, one of the most exciting and challenging strategy games uh, that there is out there. And we want to get a probability of winning the hand based on what we're currently seeing. If we have a high probability of winning the hand, then we probably want to go ahead and start bidding on the game because it's more likely that we're going to win it. And so if we start pretty much where we picked up last time, we're going to load the libraries that we're going to need. We're going to set up some kind of like options that are going to be useful to visualize our data frames and stuff like this. As a reminder, just make sure that you have a pointer to wherever you've put the material of this course. This includes the data that needs to be loaded by the notebook so that you can do all of this machine learning stuff. Essentially, you should have, like for at least this course, you should have received, again, the synthetic data contract. You also can download it from the previous lesson, which you place inside of your data MLOps folder. You just change basically your, your base path, right? So that it points to the right direction. And today we're going to be generating a bunch of more, let's say, data sets. We're going to be generating the feature store, which is the most important one. And so we're going to see how we do that. So we're just going to run this and we're going to jump directly into the overview to get a feel, like as a reminder, get a feel of the data that we're dealing with here. We are looking at data, if you didn't follow the previous live coding session, we're looking at data that precisely tell us how did previous game go in terms of like what kind of hands did we have in previous games. We have only, we have 500,000 pre previous games that we can learn from. And we have reward metric that we can use as a target variable that's gonna allow us to say like, hey, when we have these kind of cards, then we're generating this kind of reward and when we have that kind of cards, then we're generating that kind of reward. And that's exactly this machine learning system that's gonna allow us to, to know when do we tend to win? Do we tend to win when we have high cards, low cards, and stuff like this? And so what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be taking these raw data, these raw kind of like samples that we have, and we're gonna make sure that these data can be interpreted by a machine learning system so that it trains on it. Now, what does that mean? When we look at the cards that we have here, right? Like when we just play a game and we look at the cards that we have in our hand, our human brain naturally and without too much effort 
allow us to under, understand the semantic of the cards, right? Like we know we know collectively what an ace of clubs is because we collectively decided to label ace of clubs to this A-shaped, let's say, letter that contains this plant icon here. And so we collectively know that this is an ace of, of clubs, collectively know that that's a king king of hearts. But the computer, the machine learning model doesn't know that, like it doesn't know what an ace or what a king is. It just knows how to draw on numeric interpretation of, of objects and leverage numeric patterns and numeric values to learn correlations between data points. That's the only thing that the machine learning system can do. And so to be able to have a system learn from these cards, we need to translate these cards into precisely like vectors of numeric data that represents the underlying cards that they're built from. Make this point a bit more clear. Essentially, like if I if I come here and I look at the first hand, right? Like this is the first hand of the data set, so it's one of the 500,000 hands that we have. And I see in here that take the visible hand from my perspective, right? From player one perspective. This is the visible cards that we can see. And if I put them as strings instead of neat representation with the emojis and everything, now we see that clearly we're not dealing with numeric values here. We're actually dealing with a pretty pretty straightforward type of data. We're, we're dealing with a, a string or some kind of like object that tells us what cards we have in our hand. And so our job today is precisely to go from these row features into the numeric vectors that are going to represent the cards and that our model is going to be able to learn from. And so how can we do that? Well, if you think about it, essentially there is a lot of way that we can approach this, right? One of the way that we can approach this, tell our model, let's say, every card that we have by giving it a vector, kind of like a binary vector of what card is in there or not. So what I mean by a binary vector is that, you know, if we have like 32 cards in our deck, that's actually the, the way that, that this game is played, you play with 32 cards, then if you create like a binary vector that just says a one for whenever there's like a specific card, like the nine clubs, and a zero for all of the cards that tells you like, okay, this is the card that we have in our hand, well, then we end up with a pretty massive vector of data that represents our feature space. In other words, if you tell every card that we have in, in our hands, we end up with a very high dimensionality data frame that's pretty complex for our model to learn from. But if we already put a bit of brain power, especially like people who are very good at this game, if they already put a bit of brain power into the feature engineering, and instead of showing all of the cards that we have, just saying some relevant information on these cards, not just like, these are all the cards that you have, but how many jacks do you have? How many nines do you have? How many aces do you have? These are the three most powerful cards. Like, I don't care how many sevens I have. I just care that I have like two nines, uh, three jacks and, and one ace. Because if I have like, let's say four jacks, then I already know that I have a pretty strong hand. I don't care that I precisely have the jack of diamond or the jack of club. I just care that I have a lot of jacks in my hand. And so instead of being very, very, let's say low level with the way that we provide the cards, maybe we can already pre-process the features with a bit of brain power that we put into it. And that's exactly what you're gonna see in the statics in here. So if we look at the statics, and we can run this already, we will see that we set up, let's say, a basic feature store, like a set of base feature that we're gonna have by the end of the pipeline. And you will see that it contains four set of features. It contains a, a set of features that basically tells us how many suits we have in the hands, how many cards of a specific type of cards do you have? So for instance, how many nine, how many jacks and things like this? How many blood robot points you have? So this is a very specific rule and I'll, I'll go back to it. I won't, I won't discuss it too much. If you follow the tutorial on the, on the game to understand how it works, then you have, a, well, at least a basic understanding of, of what this means, but I'm just gonna repeat quickly about what that means afterwards. And how many tiers do we have? So these are like the, let's say, like the base features that we're going to have in our feature store. And you will see that the skeleton, this blueprint of the feature store is exactly what we're going to fill with our pipeline. And at the end of the day, what we're going to have is something like this. 
we're going to have a feature that tells us like we have x many cards in clubs we have x many cards in diamonds we have x nines so we have like two nines three nines four nines we have x tens like one ten two ten three tens and you know if you think about it we have like 20 points at 20 points at diamonds 20 points at hearts if you think about it if you follow this structure this template of numeric data numeric values then we have effectively converted a completely ununderstandable and unreadable set of cards that we human can understand but that models cannot understand we have converted this into a set of features that are going to allow the machine learning model to learn right because they're going to be able to understand that having one diamond is worse than having two diamonds or having three diamonds so we already do the, the combination of transforming our feature set into an understandable feature set and putting a little bit of intelligence into it so that instead of having completely vectorized uh, cards you know that tells us exactly what are the cards that we have in our hands we already have like a, a lower dimensionality lower space set of features that's going to be much easier for our model to learn on so let's get into it the way that we're going to be doing that is we're actually going to use a very neat service that the game provides for us a endpoint like an api endpoint where we're going to be able to provide as a as an input the hand that we human can understand and what it's going to give us back from this is the same hand but in, in its featureized shape right so it's going to give us that in the featureized shape and i'm going to show you like how we're going to do that so first of all we're going to write like two small helpers to be able to call this API and to get back our features from our data. And well, first of all, we're gonna set up like a very small timing function because you will see that a big part of what we're gonna discuss today is writing highly efficient code that allows us to do things much faster than you would do if you wrote, let's say, less efficient code. So we're gonna set up this small wrapper, like just a timing function, that's basically gonna be a decorator around the, the functions that we use to call the API. And so you will see that we will just kick off the um, give some counters, time chrono, run the function, get the end time, and just see like how long it took to evaluate a function, right? So this is a pretty standard, let's say, timing tool that's gonna allow us to evaluate the efficiency of our code. Now, what we have here is the feature converter endpoints, right? As its name basically says, it's a converter that allows us to go from human readable features to model readable features. And this is basically a, a very standard like API. Like if you just basically send a bunch of inputs to this endpoint here and you leverage like a method that seems to be called cards to feature, then you can go from exactly what we want. We can go from the row hand, which is the row hand containing our manually inputted hand and we could just get these cards from looking at any game that we play so we like just write this hand as a string and then what we get out of this is exactly what we wanted earlier right which is a set of features that tells us a bunch of intelligence insights like how many cards do we have in specific suits how many cards do we have as nines or jacks or aces how many points do we have in blood rub a lot and things like that and so we're going to call that clean feature right and this clean feature is exactly what we're going to apply to be able to convert our raw data to our feature store now the thing here is that we want to make this request to the api to this server that is going to do the heavy processing for us and to do that we're going to leverage a library that's called request right so to make a post post request to the API through the request module. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a module called request and we're gonna send a straightforward post request to our feature converter endpoint. And we're gonna pass as, a, as an input, we're gonna pass the row hand and we're gonna pass like another small minor detail thing that's basically gonna tell us whether we receive the data back as a scanner, like as a as value or as a list of things. So this is a very small detail. We don't really need to pay attention to that for now. But essentially what we're gonna get back from it is 
a response containing the, the data that we need. And what we're going to need to do is read this data as a JSON, right? Because if, if we have this data as a JSON, then we can apply standard manipulation like you would do to a Python dictionary. And it's going to be very convenient. So once we've done the post request, we're going to get out of this a response and we're going to call the JSON method on top of this response to have our features. And so now what we're going to get back from this is a, a dictionary containing some keys and some values for these keys, right? The, these are the keys and the values are going to be like, I don't know, we have like maybe one of them, we have maybe like two and so on. So now things get interesting when we think about the way that we're going to run this, right? And this is where a lot of the value as a machine learning engineer comes from from the ability to not just run code, but to run it in a very efficient way, right? Because if you think about it, what we could do now is essentially, we could take this raw data that we have here, like this synthetic game data that contains 500 games of hands and their reward. And we could iterate on all of these guys, just one by one, and we can send the input and get back the feature out of it, right? And append that into a dictionary up until the point where we have all the clean data that we needed. And this is exactly what we're going to do in this first method here. This first method called the launch simple sequential processing or sequential request. What we're going to do here is we are going to make a copy of our base feature DF. So this is where we're going to store, this is the feature store, this is where we're going to store the data when it's clean. So we're going to make a copy of this guy here so that we can append our data safely into this feature store. And we're going to iterate on every value of this row feature, right, which contain the human readable data. We're going to do that like 1,000 times just to start. It's always better to start with a sample. And we're going to see for each of these features that we can find in this synth synthetic game data, we're going to launch precisely the function that we have created here, right? Which is going to clean the feature. So for each of these feature here, we're going to call, we're going to apply the cleaning method on top of it. So we're going to do something like clean feature. That's what it's called. Well, actually, I'm going to run that first. And now we're going to run this clean feature thing. And we're going to apply that on the feature on which we, we are iterating. And again, as I remember, just small detail, don't, don't worry too much about this. And now what we'll get out of this, so this output that we get, which as you can like remember is this output here, this output is just some data that we're going to concatenate or merge to our feature store. And we're just going to like incrementally append this data to our feature store. And so we're going to do something that we've done already before. We're going to do some kind of like pd.concat coming directly from the API of pandas. And we're just going to print the index every time that we reach some kind of like 100 iterations. We're going to imply the index so that we see how fast things are going and make sure that we are doing it correctly. And something that we're going to do is we're going to look inside of the machine. So this is the machine where we actually are hosting the API, right? So this is part of like game, like the platform that's available, like part of this is this API that allows us to do the converter. So we're going to see in real time that these requests are really being served by the API. And so if, if I come here now and I launch the sequential, okay, so invalid character in the fire, okay, maybe something weird happened, let's see. Yeah, wasn't really important. So now we're looking at this and we're seeing that we are launching the request. It's taking quite a bit of time to be processed, right? We have only done 100, 100 requests yet, 200. But we see that because of the sequential nature of what we're doing and the fact that we launch basically this request one after the other through the API, we see that it takes a significant amount of time to be processed. We've, we have 500,000 of these hands that we want to process, that we want to clean, and we're just running basically this definition, this function, on 1,000, a sample of 1,000 
out of these 500 uh, data points. And so by having waited one minute, we only have processed 800 requests. So we're just going to let it finish, you know, like just to see how much time it took in total. Remember, this is exactly the reason why we use this timing function. We use this timing function to see that overall it took one minute to process uh, 1000 requests. So if we extrapolate a little bit and we, we wonder about how much time it would take to process the 500,000 requests, we would need to do a 1,500x on top of these 60 seconds. And so it would be 500 minutes to, to run the whole thing, which is like a few hours basically of processing before you can have your data ready. So this is not ideal. And obviously it gets, it, it gets the job done, right? Because if I come here and I look at the feature DF that we have created, we do indeed have the 1,000 data points that, that we wanted. And we have the 20 features that we were expecting from the number of cards that we have in, in the clubs, which is for instance here four, to uh, how many points that do you have and things like this. So like for instance here, like has a lot of robot at heart. So this is 20 points. So we have done the job, but it took a tremendous amount of time to, to get there. And this is exactly where you need to put your machine learning engineering hats on so that you improve things and solve the life of many, many people who maybe like are not very familiar with this kind of stuff. Instead of running things sequentially through a sequential set of Python lines, what we want to do here is we want to leverage the power of multiprocessing and parallelization so that instead of running this one line at a time, we do it in a completely parallelized way. If you think about it, having your feature, like having feature number one clean or having the, for, the first row of, of data clean doesn't depend or doesn't impact the cleaning of the second row or the third row. So you can completely parallelize the workload and you're going to get the same result, whatever happens. So if you jump into the next session, what you're going to see here is precisely what I've been trying to explain here, which is this parallelization of the workload. We're going to do fundamentally the same thing. We're not going to create any new lines of code in the sense of functionality, but we're just going to make sure that this code runs much faster. And the way we're going to do that is by using this multiprocessing module that has all of the utilities you need to spread the workload on multiple cores of your machine. And it's going to be pretty convenient to do that, especially for like API handling, because our machine here, like our machine that's actually serving the API is able to handle many, many requests concurrently as well. So just like we want the ability from our end to send several requests at the same time, we want, we want to make sure that the receiving end, so the receiving server that's in charge of handling our request can also do that, it can also process our data concurrently. And that is the case here because it's a great API that's been built by an amazing engineer. Yeah, of course it's me. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see quickly if, if, if things go well or if things go wrong. So what we're going to do here is we are going to create a multiprocessing request uh, function that's going to be doing something very similar. We're going to read the base feature DF. We're going to make a copy out of it so, we, so that we can uh, safely create new data, regenerate some features, and put them into the feature DF. And in, instead of sequentially or like instead of iterating on each row of our data frame, what we're going to do is we are going to set up a pool of workers, right? Pool of worker and a, a pool of worker, which is in, an object that allows us to spread the workload on the CPU. You can definitely like check out the API, which is very, very well explained, very convenient to use. And you will quickly see that you can set up things that are object to be able to spread the workload. So you can set up a pool of let's say five workers inside of your object and you're going to be able to spread the workloads to these five workers 
in parallel or like concurrently basically. And so that's what we're going to do here. Now that we have our pool of five worker, what we want to do is we want to launch the cleaning. We want to launch this cleaning by mapping the processing unit. So the function that we have defined earlier, this cleaning feature function, and we want to map this on the input data, right? Like we're going to, we're going to process like in parallel 1000 samples of our row synthetic data and we're going to collect the output and we're going to merge this output again with the feature store to visualize to see whether it's worked or not so we're going to do again pandas comma get so that we merge the placeholder feature store with the new data that's that's generated from the output and we're going to see what happens so now we jump back to our machine to, to this api that we're using and we see that this machine here is, well, it's done already, actually. We see that this machine has dealt with many, many different requests that it has received. And intuitively, it should feel quite natural to see that it took much less time, basically, to run this multi-processing version of the code on the 1,000 sample sets that we had before took much, much less time. It took only 11 seconds to do it in contrast to the 62 seconds that we had before. And that is already the, the magic of multiprocessing at play here. Because when you have a pool of more workers spreading the work of your workload, you reach the same result as you have here. You reach the same result, completely the same result. You can compare the data, you'll see that it's exactly the same. But you've done that much, much, much faster. And it's quite good, pretty happy with the results that we have here. But, you know, if you reach the point where you don't have maybe like 500 samples of data, but you have 500 million samples of data that you have to, to run in parallel, you will still have a tremendous amount of waiting time until you can enjoy your features. Because if it takes 100 seconds to process 1000 samples of data, and the and the scalability or like the complexity is, is pretty linear like you're just gonna scale up in the sense that it's gonna take the same amount of time to process i don't know like 10 20 50 100 x amount of data then you're still gonna wait like a huge amount of time before you can have access to your features so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a third method that's pretty strong to parallelize our workflow as well this third method is quite different, at least in terms of like framework and in instead of mindset, it's quite different than multiprocessing. Multiprocessing is just pure parallelization across pools of workers and leveraging like different cores. The second method that we're gonna look at, or like the second process that we're gonna look at, it is async IO. It became quite prevalent in the industry to, to use this library. It has a tremendous power to parallelize your, like not to parallelize, but to run workflow in a concurrent way. In fact, it's actually, it's not very correct of me to, to call this parallelization because in this case, I believe this is much more concurrent processing, right? I definitely recommend you go check out the difference if you have time, but essentially, instead of having like parallelized workflow here, we have event loop, we have a running loop that just continuously checks whether one of the CPUs is available for processing and you know just distribute tasks basically in this very fluid and, and flexible way. And so the way that things are gonna work now is we are gonna, again, we're gonna set up a base copy of our data. So re-replicate our feature store, we empty it and keep in mind, Keep in mind what we're doing here, right? Like we're, we're not doing to do anything different from what we've done before. We just want to populate our feature store with our raw data that's being cleaned. So we empty it first and we want to find a way to do things faster than we've done with the sequential processing and the parallelized processing. But we want to reach the same result as we have here, right? So that's going to be the same outcome. And the way that we do this is by, first of all, setting up some async request mechanism. So we're going to set up a async context manager, which is going to be spinning up a new session and which is going to be exactly what we need 
launch kind of like the, the processing request for each of our hands in our data frame. But the thing here, what's going to be different is that even though even though it's going to look very sequential, you know, we're going to do, be doing an iteration like for every hand in our hands. So even though it's going to look very sequential, the difference between what we're doing here and what we were doing in the sequential processing is that here we're going to make a request and then we're going to wait until we have the request and we're going to release our CPUs to do other things until it has hears backs basically from the loop and until it gets kind of like the loop back so that it, it can like provide the, the output to the main system. So let's do a bit of coding to, to see how that works. We are going to set up a async context manager. So we're going to do something like async, uh, async with. I think we with is going to set up this session, right? That we can use to coordinate the event loop. And essentially what we do here is we iterate over all the hands that we receive from our data frame. So as you can see, we're going to call this async request function on all of the hands that we have. And the hands are basically the row features that we have from the synthetic game data. So we're going to provide this guy here to the async request. And we're going to be doing this iteration on all of the hand. And for each hand in the hands, we're going to append the result of calling the API. And calling the API is just going to be this make request, right? This is really like the house of the system here. This make request is very similar to what we've seen before. It's just a pure request, let's say, to our API. And so this is what we're going to use to launch a request to get this send, make a request. And when we make the request, essentially what we do is we provide the hand on which we want to do the processing. We provide the session. We provide some kind of like quarks, right, which are like potential extra arguments that we might want to use at a later stage. And once we have applied the processing, wait for the results to go back, to come back to us. And as long as the results are not coming back, we can release some CP to the other task. This is exactly the essence of the concurrency in this system. But we do have like, the make request that keeps working in the background until the cleaning, the processing is done. And so this make request is exactly what's happening, let's say, in here. It receives a hand. So it receives one of the hands on which we've iterated. It receives a session and it receives the arguments. And essentially what it does is it's going to make this await a wait request coming from the session, right? It's going to make this async request coming from the session. It's going to wait for it. And when it receives it, when it receives this response by sending this post request to the feature endpoint, providing the hand, when it receives this data back, the response, then it just reads it as a JSON and it provides it back as a feature to the main loop, right? So here, what we're going to do is we're going to do a await request.host. I think that should do the job. So we're going to make our post request. We're going to run and get the data back. And then we're going to launch, like we're going to yield back, let's say, the features when they're processed and cleaned. And so that's how the whole system works. And again, like, don't worry about it. If it's like, I just want to show you what's possible to do and what's, what's kind of like around so that you have an idea of how you like, what kind of direction you should take if you want to get better at this. But obviously now it's time to see like the system working end to end. So I'm going to follow back this. I get the output back when the whole thing has run. And when the output is back, I can just append it as always to our feature store and I can see the performance of like how the whole thing basically worked, right? So I'm just gonna like launch this guy on 1000 data points to make it comparable to what we had before. Okay, something is not working. Request is not defined. All right, so what I need to do here is await, not a request, I need to await the session request. Session request. And the method that I use for this request is a post. So all of this comes from session and I launch it. And now I go back to my machine. I actually didn't even have time to look at what was happening in the, in the machine because I see that we just sped up the whole process from 11 seconds that it took while we were doing it as a multi-processing pipeline 
to less than three seconds to actually run this processing on the 1000 data sets that we had and to get back exactly the same output that we want. So we see how powerful this asynchronous framework is to be able to get stuff done concurrently and get some data quickly from wherever we need. So now that we have our, let's say, base feature set, right? Like now that we have our set of base features that we're gonna be using for our machine learning model, what we can do is we can build a bunch of features on top of this, right? Like more features that are gonna be useful, that are gonna be like explicit, and that, that's gonna like improve the performance of our model. And so some of the features are things that are pretty obvious, for instance, what we could do is instead of providing only the points that we have for each different suit, so for instance, 20 points at clubs, 20 points at diamonds, 20 points at heart, 20 points at spade, what we want to be giving is the total amount of points that you have across all the suits. And the way that we're going to do that is pretty straightforward. We're going to like take our feature DF and we're going to do the sum of all of the features that we have. So we have like the feature for Ballot Robolot. We have uh, Ballot Robolot at clubs, at diamonds, at hearts, at spades. So we're just gonna do the sum of all of these guys so that we make this feature more explicit, right? Now we're gonna have this new feature total BR points, which is gonna be very useful. And we're gonna see what we're doing it later. Now, the second thing that we wanna do is this feature total tiers points. So again, like very similar, but we're gonna be using a, an other set of features. So here we're gonna be using this guy here, like whether we have a, a tiers at clubs, whether we have a tiers at diamonds, hearts, and at spades. And then the final one, the final feature that we're gonna be using here is the sum of these two features, right? And again, we're doing this because we want to make it easier for our model to learn this structure, like to learn explicitly on these features, rather than, than kind of like infer this from the underlying features, right? So it's just making things a bit more explicit and it could improve quite a lot the, the training of the model. And so here we're gonna take we're gonna take this and we're gonna make it like this. Total A and D points. So the total amount of points is gonna be the total points at Ballot Robolot plus the total point at tiers. And now what we're going to do is we're going to merge our features. So these are the features that we've created from the previous sections. And we're going to merge all of these features with some of the things that we're going to need at a later stage, like the reward. This is going to be our target variable. The contract, we're going to be able to segment our errors. Like we are going to be able to learn how we're performing and what kind of errors we're generating for different kind of contracts that we have. We're gonna be adding a few more features that we had before, the last beater, the starter, the face value of the points. So these are features that are very useful and that we need to provide to our model as well. So we're gonna be merging basically all of these new features that we created with these old timers here and the target variable, right? So this is the merging that we do there. And then we're gonna be doing a bit of encoding, right? Like we, we wanna take this contract and instead of having it as a set of string values, like hearts, spade, diamonds, and this kind of stuff, we want to have, instead of having like this, we want to have like some kind of dummies that tells us whether we're playing at clubs or are we playing at diamonds and things like this. And so we're going to be doing this dummization of data by using a panda function that is called get dummies. And this get dummies is going to like create directly dummies directly from the contract. And then finally, the last thing that we're gonna do in our feature engineering pipeline is we are gonna categorize the reward. We're not gonna try to predict the amount of points that we get, which is pretty hard for the model, but we're just pretty happy to know whether we've won or not. Like if the model already learns as a classifier whether we're gonna win or lose the hand, then we're pretty happy with that. It's gonna allow us to know whether we should play or not. So we're gonna categorize this to turn the whole problem not into a regression problem, but to turn it into a classification problem. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna learn, we're gonna get the reward target variable, and we're gonna apply some kind of logic so that we, we turn it into this categorization variable that tells us whether player one has one. 
And the way we do that is by applying some kind of la lambda function and saying like, hey, put a one if the reward is bigger than zero, otherwise put a zero and that's it. And now what we have created here is a highly customizable and highly flexible pipeline that contains all of the steps we need to go from our features to our, let's say, complete set of features. Like our feature containing the three missing features that we had, the merge, the encoding of the contract, and the categorization. And once we have done this, we have what we can call the feature store. Because the feature store is exactly, let's say, the data in a state of complete processing, in a state so clean and so ready that you know that you don't need to apply any additional processing to it. You can just take these features, take this data, take them off the shelf and apply whatever modeling, whatever model you want on top of it. That's exactly the state that we wanted to get to. And you will see that when we move on to the next, uh, the next step, which is the modeling pipeline, you will see that we are expediting quite quickly things by just having this pipeline in such a good state, in such a processed state, right? It's just going to be literally taking something off the shelf. So now the last step of this pipeline is just to make sure that things run however we want them to run. And that brings us to the concept of unit testing. The concept of unit testing is pretty simple in itself, but a lot of people get it wrong, either out of extreme laziness or out of lack of practical understanding of how you do it. And so the way that you need to understand unit testing is that you wanna take all the processing units that you have. So for instance, these are processing units that we have, right? Whenever you give something as an input and you get something out as an output, you wanna be able to make sure that if I provide any arbitrary input to this function, I will get the corresponding output out of it. And that's exactly what unit testing is concerned with. Unit testing is concerned about fixing the behavior of a functional unit by providing a predetermined input and making sure that the resulting output is what you would have expected if it had run you know, in the wild. That's exactly what we're gonna do here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create like a unit test suite that fixes some input and fixes some output and, and make sure that by running some, some function on some input, you get the output back. And so for instance, we're gonna test that uh, let's say the custom feature total blood robot points works correctly. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna get from the fixtures, which is basically a set of inputs that are, we have organized however we want it to be organized. We're gonna get from that basically like all of this stuff. All right, and the way we're gonna test this function is we're gonna apply this feature total BR points, which is remember, this is a function that we have defined earlier. This is a function that takes as an input a bunch of features, like the one that we have created here, and produce as an output a new column that contains the total amount of points. So what we're expecting from this functional unit is to be able to do something like this. Apply it on a feature set, right? And this feature set here comes from our fixtures. It comes from a data frame that we have created artificially just to control the output that we would expect to get out of it, right? So here we have given like a bunch of features like BR at clubs, BR at diamonds, BR, BR at hearts, BR at spades. And we have simplified completely the features that we provide so that we can control, we can make sure we observe what we get out of this and we can make sure that we have what we would have expected to have if this function ran in the wild. So we apply this feature total BR point to our custom-made fixture here, to our custom-made data frame here, we drop the column that it's supposed to be producing, right? Because that's exactly the column that we want this to produce. So we drop it first, so that afterwards what we can do is we can do a pandas testing assert equal, so we can assert that two data frames are equal, and we compare what was generated by our function to what we're expected to get when this function has run correctly, right? So here it's a bit confusing because we actually use the same function as an input as an, and as an output, but I want you to understand the general idea of controlling basically what you provide as an input, controlling what you check as an output, so kind of like fixing things, controlling things, and running your function on this controlled input to get the controlled output. And so that's, it. that's exactly what we do. We apply the function 
on the controlled input and what we get out of this function, we compare it to what we believe you, we should get out of this function, which is again just this feature df, but now with this column here created from the fact that you pass it to this function. And so if you run this, you will see that this test here runs properly, this test has run properly, all the tests are okay, and you will see that you know this is the first step towards having a testing suite that runs properly. And we will see later on much more tests that we can run because here we've just tested one thing. We've just tested that this function works properly, but we want to check that everything we do in this custom pipeline works properly. And to do that, we're going to be running this code, this unit testing suite that we've created just for one function. We're going to be replicating that for many more.